Welcome back to 13 News at 530. This is the most important story of my entire 30-year career. The time of tiptoeing around the issues of racism and disparity, it's over. As millions of people are now having very intentional conversations about justice. As a journalist, I must always remain objective. And the death of George Floyd is objectively about humanity. It's really been excruciating for me and my family to talk about that video of the officer's knee on Floyd's neck. Because I see and I hear my own son, 12 years old, crying out for mom. I posted these pictures of the two of us on social media this past weekend. My husband and I, we are hugging Ian tighter than ever because yet again, here we are having a talk. Quite honestly, I'm tired and I'm exhausted of telling my son that you can become anything you want in life, but knowing that he will face obstacles along the way rooted in racism. So I decided to convene a group of five women to share their own stories of racial injustice. And tonight, how all of us, all of us, we have to stand up for one another and to use this worldwide moment of pain to birth a brand new movement for civil and equal rights. 13 listens, time for change. Hold your breath for just two minutes and see if you can do that. And this was eight minutes and 46 seconds. Everyone saw it. I can't breathe. That means I'm invisible. You don't see me. When we all look at that video, we all see a black man. And anybody that says anything differently sort of needs to challenge their own honesty. How do you all feel when you when you play that video? Like, I will never get rid of that video, that sound, what he said, and what happened out of my, out of my spirit. It's like deep in my soul. I feel very um, hurt. I feel very frustrated. And I feel fearful for my son and my daughters. I had a friend from high school that was age 13. I've known for 45 years, 50 years, really. I went to visit her, you know. She knew my husband. She knew my kids. Long story short, uh, I talked to her about something, and she flat out said, I don't believe that, you know, there's a difference in racial profiling. Please protect She unfriended me in real life. In real life, she unfriended me because she didn't believe it. Well, now she sees with her own eyes. As they got older, they got driver's license. Then the talk began, okay, if you're out there driving, you can't have a lot of people in the car. If you get stopped for any reason, make your, put your hands on the steering wheel. Don't reach for anything. <laughs> You know, we would have those talks constantly because we wanted to make sure they came back home safely. Our 23-year-old, when we lived in Kansas City, we would give him the talk, same thing. But on his 18th birthday, with predominantly white friends in the car, was racially profiled and pulled over by the sheriff's office. And he was horrified and terrified. He was terrified to reach, you know, it, to get the registration. Making sure that only two people are in the car at one time. Do not ride four people deep, you know? I mean, every time he leaves this house, I'm having these type of conversations with him. Uh, I told him every time he leaves the house, just like her, you, you can't do what everybody else does. He thought I was such a mean mom. My grandson is 13. He's six one. The night my daughter told me that. She had the talk with him, and he said, can we move, this was numerous years ago, can we move to Hawaii where President Obama's born? <gasps> because he thought maybe it wasn't racist there. Not oh, just by police. It's in the workplace. I mean, it's, we're treated differently. With work, I've always felt that I've got to be better than my counterpart. Yeah. I can't just do my job well, I've got to be exceptional, just to be viewed at the same level. I'm going back to, all the way back to 1976 when I married outside my race. My husband, uh, dropping him off at a new trucking job, and after dark, so that no one would see that I was white because it was in Mooresville. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, the next time he went out on the road, he was in the mountains and his brakes had been cut. I've lost a child on her 25th birthday by a medical injustice, I should say. And so I do know that uh, even though we try to protect our kids, that we are absolutely powerless. You know that it's because I'm Black is the reason why that happened. But as soon as you voice that, then you get that pushback. Oh, here they go with the race card. The, the stress, I've had to rely on my faith over the years very heavily. Um, but it's, it's more of a, a just a, a physical exhaustion, just tired. People that are white, uh, the first thing, my first responsibility is to listen. So just because I have biracial children and just because my husband is black, I need to know that does not make me a part of black culture. It doesn't, I mean, I get to partake of it, but it doesn't make me understand what it is to be black in America. How have you been able to reconcile living in both worlds and and seeing both sides, white privilege, obviously, and then having your children and grandchildren um, come home and maybe talk about racist things that have happened to them? I will call you out. I don't care if you're the CEO or who you are. And I have done it over and over again. I'll do it nicely at first. I'll check you. Faith without works is dead, right? So for me, it starts with us. It starts with, you know, what can I do? It means that I'm going to have to be uncomfortable having some of those courageous conversations. When people say, I don't see color, I don't like that. I want you to see my color. The yeah. problem is, don't treat me unfairly because of my color. Right. White people like me educate other white people that it's time for you to not just be in a room and just kind of, you know, that was really inappropriate. So I'm going to leave the room. No, I'm yeah. going to say, and this generation is saying, no, it's your responsibility to speak up. You failed to do that. And now we're going to make you speak up. It truly is time to have transparent and sometimes difficult conversations with each other. And we're doing that, and we should, because we want all of us, and especially our children, like my son, so that they can freely, freely live from the shackles of bias, the shackles of prejudice, and the shackles of unequal treatment. My conversation with these five women will continue tonight at 11 o'clock about the meaning of the worldwide protest, as well as their hope for the future. And that's the good news. There's always hope. We can do better, and I believe we will as a nation. You can also watch the entire hour-long conversation on our our website at WTHR.com. Again, that will be posted after the 11 o'clock news tonight. Again, we are in this together to make positive changes. Thank you so much for listening and embracing it.